those armored vehicles have started arriving at the National Mall. Moved in overnight through Washington, D.C., carefully so as not to damage local roads and bridges for the president's so-called salute to America, hyping it up as the show of a lifetime. Some incredible equipment, military equipment on display. Acting Defense Secretary Mark Esper and Chairman of the Joint Chiefs General Joseph Dunford are among the military officials who will attend. But CNN has learned that some military chiefs have expressed reservations about politicizing the July 4th celebration concerned about the tanks and armored vehicles on display. And while the overall cost of the event has not been released, today the president defended the plans, tweeting, the cost of our great salute to America tomorrow will be very little compared to what it is worth. We own the planes. We have the pilots. The airport is right next door. All we need is the fuel. We own the tanks and all. But that tweet is misleading, as many of the aircraft involved in the ceremony will be flying in from around the country. F-35 fighter jets from California, a B-2 stealth bomber from Missouri, Apache helicopters from Kentucky, and the Blue Angels from Florida, all burning costly fuel to get to Washington. We're going to have planes going overhead, the best fighter jets in the world, and other planes too. And the president's checklist ignores additional costs and security, personnel, and infrastructure. For example, the see-through bulletproof barrier needed for the president's speech at the Lincoln Memorial $24,000. And that's not all. The Washington Post reporting the National Park Service will divert nearly 2.5 million extra from fees paid by visitors and intended to improve parks across the country for the president's event. Compared to the usual cost of about 2 million for the entire 4th of July celebration on the mall. There's outrage this morning after a New Jersey judge ruled that a teenager accused of raping a girl at a party deserved leniency because pressing criminal charges could ruin that teen's life. Judge, judge James Troiano said, quote, this young man comes from a good family who put him into an excellent school where he was doing extremely well. He is clearly a candidate for not just college, but probably for a good college. His scores for college entry were very high. This all started in 2017 when a 16 year old boy allegedly raped, again, raped a 16 year old girl at a party the boy was also accused of filming the alleged assault. Prosecutors say that he forwarded the clip to several friends. One of them said it showed the girl apparently incapacitated by intoxication, her head repeatedly hitting a wall. Prosecutors also claim that following the incident, the boy sent a text message to his friend saying, quote, when your first time having sex was rape. Goodness. Prosecutors asked the judge to try the 16-year-old as an adult. However, the judge denied that request, and he scolded prosecutors for not explaining to the girl and her mother the devastating effect that filing charges in adult criminal court would have on the boy's life. Last month, an appellate court reversed Judge James Troiano's decision. It is now up to prosecutors to seek an indictment in adult criminal court. Criminal defense attorney and CNN legal analyst Joey Jackson joins me now to discuss. So remarkable circumstances in, in this case. Yeah. I mean, have you seen judges do this before, talk about, well, he's a good kid. That's a mitigating circumstance. Unfortunately, you do. Now, breaking it down further, so let's talk about what happened here. There's a 16-year-old who engaged in an alleged sexual assault, mm -hmm. filmed that sexual assault with him penetrating the girl, and what prosecutors did, very aptly and justly, Jim, was they said, you know, we're going to treat this as an adult offense. Mm -hmm. So what you do is you petition the court to try him, the 16-year-old, in adult court. And in the context of doing that, because you meet certain factors, one of those being if it were, if you were an adult, it would be a felony rape case. And so they do that, and the judge says, not only will we not do it, but we're going to re-victimize the victim by saying, you didn't adequately explain to the family the effect it could have on their life. This is a problem in many ways. First of all, and from a legal perspective, then we'll talk social, from a legal perspective, the judge was wrong on the law. Mm -hmm. You don't evaluate someone's family, where they come from, who they are Their in the context scores, at yeah. all, in the context of deciding whether something is appropriate for uh, a higher court, as in this instance, you look and you determine, are the factors present? Would it have been a crime, a felony crime, if you were an adult? That's the issue. The issue is not what the judge did. That's the legal problem. 
the social problem, Jim, is that what we all know, right? Mm. This is another thing of privilege gone amok. Mm. If we're going to have a system, the system has to work for everyone. Otherwise, people lose faith in it. Yep. And yep. people ask the obvious question, would this have occurred if this was a person, you know, from a disadvantaged background, a disadvantaged community, mm -hmm. a person of color? And the answer is resoundingly no. Right. And that and was in the, 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 the panel when they were yeah. criticizing this decision. They said exactly that. They said that the juvenile came from a good family and had a good had good test scores, we assume, would not condemn the juveniles who do not come from good families and do not have good test scores from withstanding waiver application. Uh, I mean, it's right there in, in the way the appellate court handled this. It is, and I think they did their job. And what that was was to look at this judge and to rebuke him accordingly because that's not the standard. What does it say, number one, to the victim that you treat this crime uh, as you do and just dismiss it and deminimize it? What does it say to people at large that if you come from good families, whatever that is, yeah. we're going to treat you differently? Because you have privileged backgrounds, we're going to treat you differently. If you don't, though, we're going to. Think about the implication. If the judge would have granted this, and now, of course, it is granted, he's being treated in a higher court. When you are a juvenile, it's about rehabilitation, not about jail. If the judge would have granted the prosecutor's application, now it gets tried in adult court, which it will now, mm -hmm. and the implications are so serious, up to 20 years in jail. Yeah. So how many times does this happen, I want to ask the question, where we're not talking about it on the news, where as a matter of mm. standard parlance and practice, judges throughout this country, not only in New Jersey, are making decisions predicated upon someone's family, predicated yeah. upon their background, and not predicated of the merits of the offense and what they did and what, what they did mm -hmm. deserves. And right. that's a shame.